Thank you for joining From Adolfo's Desk Live. The webinar will begin shortly. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today's From Adolfo's Desk Live. Uh, it's great to be with you all again. Um, today I have one of my favorite uh, guest stars on, uh, on From Adolfo's Desk Live, and that is Fred Stein, who's our VP of Revenue Planning and Development. Um, and <clears throat> hello, Fred, how are you? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm doing great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, so Fred, uh, you know, one of the, one of the highlights, I think, cause you've done this before with me, I think we did a travel weekly webinar once, and I can't remember if you were on from Adolfo's Us Live. So you've, you may, we may have some, uh, people that have, uh, met you before online. Um, uh, but for those who are joining for the first time and getting to know who you are, um, we'd love to uh, hear a little bit about your story at Carnival. Yeah, sure. So, uh, haven't been here quite as long as you, but uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm a long edging time up. Nonetheless. It's uh, edging up on uh, 31 years here uh, next month, actually. So uh, it's been oh. uh, a great journey. And actually, uh, you know, I had the pleasure to work with a lot of the trade partners and uh, hopefully some that are on the call today uh, as part of my history. So uh, I started out uh, in what we used to call the inside sales team. Um, and then I moved on to sales and marketing and held a bunch of roles there. But uh, ultimately, where I, I spent the most time working directly with our trade partners was uh, working on the co-op and commission uh, arrangements and also the, uh, the, the BDM's uh, sales targets. So I did that for a very, very long time. And then I, uh, I jumped over to the, uh, the world of revenue management. And uh, uh, over there, I... <laughs> pardon? It suited you. Yes. So, well, you know, I've always been very uh, analytical. Uh, so uh, revenue management was uh, was good there. And then there was an opportunity along the way uh, for the, uh, the revenue management uh, team to pick up the deployment world. So uh, that's uh, I picked that up, I think, in 2016. So I've been doing that. Uh, wow. Seven uh, years? For se seven years now. It's hard to believe. Time flies. So no, when are you uh, getting so, yeah. great? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's uh, practically white, so, uh, <laughs> so de definitely. But yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great journey, a uh, lot of fun, uh, and never a dull moment. Yeah, and I noticed that some of the uh, ex Carnival people that are all over the place uh, that worked with you, loved working with you back in the day, are uh, going to be joining us as well today to watch. Uh, so. No pressure or anything, uh, Fred. No, no, no pressure. And shout out and hello to everybody. And uh, I'll be looking forward to some good questions later. I saw like Regina was going to join. We had um, Shannon, Linda Schaefer. Hopefully they're on uh, watching uh, because the, you always have like, I mean, I think that you have one of the most interesting jobs at Carnival. Um, I was sharing with you earlier when we were on before this that, um, and I said this to Glenn April before that I love his job. I, that would be a cool job to have. And of course mm -hmm. yours as well, but I'm not quite, I, I'm analytical, but not quite to the level that you are. Uh, I still don't know what a pivot table is and I don't know how to <laughs> do any of that stuff, but um, luckily you do. And uh, you do a great job. And um, I, I really thought it was interesting. You know, this topic is always really interesting because deployment and itinerary planning, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, it's just you look on a map and, hey, we can go there or let's go to this one or that one. And there's just so much more involved uh, in doing that. So let's talk a little bit about what you go through um, as you're thinking about itinerary planning and, and the process that you go through and all the different teams that you end up working with. Yes, so um, would that it would be as simple as push a button and out it pops, but uh, it is not. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what makes it fun and interesting. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of go through what we, we look at at a high level. Uh, you know, one of the, the first things is, you know, what's the competitive landscape look like? Where, where do we 
see others uh, in the cruise space and or expect to see them uh, in the future? And how does that play in with us? And I, I think everyone on the call knows, I mean, we're primarily North American focused with our deployment uh, and Australian focused, right? And we, we perform a similar role in Australia that we do in North America where we're, you know, we're we're in the two major ports down there to uh, allow the local market to easily access us, uh, access us, much the same as we have the 14 North American home ports to let uh, much of North America uh, access us easily here. Uh, and I know we quote this all the time, but I never get tired of saying it, that uh, you know, so, more, than half, more yeah. than half the country is within a five hour drive of one of our home ports. Yes, I say that all the time too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And of course, you know, now I think there's seeing... a lot of travel too, expense and the hassle, uh, especially for a family. You know, we carry a lot of families, more families than any other cruise line, and it makes it much more affordable and convenient for them as well. Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, air is a big cost component uh, to the vacation. So uh, it, it's nice that they can get there uh, in a car fairly easily. Uh, so anyway, we start off looking at the competitive landscape. We also use consumer insights and, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a couple uh, prongs there. So we've got our uh, surveys that we do of our past guests. Uh, you know, how did you like Port Timbuktu? Uh, so we have that data, uh, but we also do surveys too. And I know many of the trade partners on the call here have probably received some of these surveys from us. So thank you uh, for helping us with your insights too. But uh, you know, we survey the, the trade in terms of where they think uh, people want to go. And then uh, we also survey our past guests, where do they want to go? And then we usually, uh, you know, find a, a panel of cruise rookies who've never been in a cruise before and see where they go. And we use that to, uh, to influence our decisions on uh, which ports we, uh, we want to focus on. And we use something called marquee value, which is basically interest uh, times um, knowledge so do you know the port exists number one and if you know it uh you know do you want to go uh, what are some ports that have more key value oh boy so there's a lot of them that you know it's it's interesting because uh people have been to a lot of ports so some of them that are very high highly rated so i'll use half moon key as an example right yeah. people have been there a lot because we go a lot but it's so it's so well regarded that people want to go back again and again. So it has it, it has interest, awareness, and desire to visit again. Uh, and then, of course, you know, in, these ports, your, Fred, do you travel to some? Of, do you travel to some of these ports, or do you mostly just do it all from a map? <laughs> well, so I've been to you know in the course of my thirty plus years here, I've been to most of the ports, uh, not only in the Caribbean but uh, in uh, in Europe. Um, haven't been to too many of the ones that we sail to from Australia. I've been to Australia, but not to the uh, the South Pacific destinations that we call on. Uh, so let's see. So, so the next thing we look at is um, what we'll call the programs, right? So what we define as a program is Miami seven day, for example, right? So that's a ship in Miami that's doing seven day cruises. And then we've got a sort of a flavor of that called Miami eight six or let's say Port Canaveral three and four day, et cetera. So that's, that's a program. And we begin to you know, sort of assign our assets to the programs we think are the best fit uh, for our brand, our customers, and also for the ship itself, right? So, uh, and, and here's where you get a lot of operational considerations that enter into the game. So uh, for example, uh, Baltimore, uh, it's got a couple of bridges uh, that, only certain ships can get on there. So that yeah. limits the choice of, uh, of ships that you could put in Baltimore. Tampa's got a similar situation. Uh, Vancouver, Canada, which we don't currently sail from, but it's also got uh, a bridge height limitation. So, so oh, there's that. Does Jacksonville have a bridge? Jacksonville does have uh, another uh, very low bridge. Um, we, can, we can just barely squeak a spirit class under there um, mm -hmm. with not a lot of margin, but mm -hmm. uh, they, they can get in. Uh, so yeah, so we have to we have to look at that, and uh, you know another good example of that is uh, Sydney, Australia. There's that iconic bridge there, uh, and there is a terminal on the other side of the bridge, but we're, none none of our ships can actually get to it. So, uh, you know, we're we're there vying with everybody else for the one berth that mm -hmm. uh, is on the uh, the outside of the bridge. 
Yeah. Uh, so there's all kinds of those considerations. There's, you know, the size of the berths and the ports that you go to. Do they have the in infrastructure? For example, you know, take Mardi Gras in celebration with 6,000 plus people on board. Is the port equipped to handle that, that many people? Uh, there's more even mundane things like the alignment of the gangway. If the tide goes up and down and can, can we have enough gangways out when the tide is at a certain point to enable a good flow of guests off and on shore? So that, that list goes on. I could bore you all for days on that. <laughs> I don't think uh, but, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, really the, you know, let's call it the biggest part of the equation is what we call itinerary gross profit, which is, you know, how much money do we think this particular uh, program is going to drive for the corporation? Um, and we call it itinerary gross profit. It's basically the uh, the ticket revenue uh, and what mm -hmm. people pay for the cruise, uh, the onboard revenue that the, we, uh, we receive from them when they're sailing on board, and then less the cost of fuel. Um, mm -hmm. And fuel has, uh, over the course of, you know, 30 years of history at Carnival, fuel has become a much more important component than it was for two reasons, really. Um, First and foremost, it's for just the uh, the uh, carbon neutral, not really carbon neutral, but the carbon reduction goals that uh, the corporation has. We want to be good corporates. We want to be good citizens of the planet. We're always looking to find ways to reduce emissions. You know, one of the, the best ways to reduce emissions is to not sail as far and not sail as fast. Right. Uh, so, uh, so. And then, of course, that also leads to a reduction in the fuel cost. And you know, we partner very closely with our, our friends in, um, on the fuel team, and they have all kinds of energy efficiency projects that they're working with uh, on the ships to uh, make them even more efficient than they already are. We've got our, you know, our LNG girls uh, that are uh, industry leading in terms of lower emissions uh, and certainly per, uh, per berth. Uh, so we've got all those things, but, you know, the job isn't done and we always want to strive to do better. Uh, so we're, we're always balancing this equation of, uh, you know, the number of ports you can include in an itinerary, because the more ports you go to, generally the faster you have to sail, the more fuel you're going to burn. Uh, and also the distance of those ports. And we're, we're trying to, you know, put together the secret sauce to come up with the, uh, the best recipe for uh, maximizing our uh, portfolio profitability. Mm -hmm. And then, and then once we get you know past that sort of program level, then we go right down into the the granularity of the itinerary mix. So, is it Eastern Caribbean? Is it Western Caribbean? Is it Southern Caribbean? Is it uh, you know is it Grand Cayman and Cozumel, or is it uh, I don't know Grand Turk and Ambercombe? So mm -hmm. you know we're constantly making these uh, trade offs. We're always looking at our past results for insights and then also the survey results that uh, we talked about earlier to balance that out and come out with what we think is the the best mix to drive demand and people walking in your doors to uh, to book a carnival cruise yeah and, you know you talk uh, about gross profit and you know maybe that that sounds uh, a little selfish but at the same time you know gross profit for us uh, is a good thing for travel agents because the more we get from ticket, the higher their commissions are. So it, exactly, it, right. It helps us both. Exactly. And then just to put some sense of scale on that, you know, we do this only for the Carnival brand, not uh, not for the rest of uh, uh, the Carnival Corp sisters, but we've got 27 kids that we care for, 27 chips. And in general, uh, any given year, that's about 1,600 plus sailings and over 4,000 uh, ports of call that we're managing. And when you figure that we've got um, right now at least two to three years worth of inventory that's open for sale and we're managing, you, you know, we're, we're kind of juggling, you know, eight to 12,000 port calls. And, you know, you'll, you'll see that every now and again, we'll change an itinerary because of an open sailing because something has changed. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a big logistics and kudos to, uh, our team that uh, that handles this, and ultimately, you know, six thousand uh, hopefully happy guests a year. Six million. Uh, I should have been thousand. Did I say six thousand? Six million. Yeah, yeah. six thousand is only one cruise of uh, Mardi Gras celebration. And yeah. Um, 
but uh, yeah, six million guests a year, and uh, we do this uh, you know every year on uh, our cycles. We do May to April, so we open a year's worth of inventory at a time. I know some of our sisters and others they do uh, six month tranches instead, but uh, we've always found it it works best for us on uh, on one year cycles. And we're currently uh, let's say putting the finishing touches on our. Uh, uh, May of 25 to April of 26 uh, cycle, which we're going to talk a little bit about uh, further on the, the next slide. So you know, yep. I, I, I took, you know, what's really complicated and distilled it down to five minutes or so. So <laughs> happy to answer any other questions you all might have at the end. All right, Fred. And it's not just, you know, you and your team, you, it, it does take a village, right? So you're, you're the deployment team and these are all the other areas that you have to work with in order to get this all done, right? Right, so it, it takes a village. There's a lot of folks that, uh, that help piece this together. And uh, you know, we're, we're balancing, um, let's say in some cases, different priorities. And a, a classic example that I'd like to, I like to use is, um, you know, the, the folks that run the casino, they, they would prefer that we are not in port ever. <laughs> um, whereas I wonder why, right, cause they, they want the casino open and they ship to be at sea and, you know, the bar people feel similarly, whereas the folks that run shore excursions, they want us to be in a port every single day. So mm -hmm. we, we have to balance these, um, uh, let's not really competing is not the right word, but balance these different priorities to come out with the, the best outcome for all. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously we, we have a big impact on the guests. We work with our new builds teams, like, you know, Hey, when is, Ship X is going to be delivered and ready, and what? How can we uh, get her to port? Environmental is a big piece. Fuel, we already talked about. Uh, you know, our colleagues in revenue management that do all the pricing. So we we work. We're working with them very closely right now on the scheduling for uh, you know what we open for sale when. I think you know we just uh, opened some sailings uh, last week um, on the West Coast, and uh, we we've got a few more uh, releases to come. Uh, so stay tuned on those. Yeah. And, you know, our folks in port ops, uh, you know, we hammer them with a lot of port requests and uh, they, uh, they do a great job of, uh, of delivering. And, you know, we, like I said, we worked uh, earlier uh, with the surveys with our trade partners. We talked to the sales force all the time, you know, marketing, accounting, the, the list goes on. You can see all the slides there. Yeah, and I, I do want to talk a little bit about the corporate and the sister brands because we work um, together. Obviously, you know, there's some corporately owned ports, um, Half Moon Key, Princess Keys that we use, and uh, Amber Cove. We've got Berths and Cozumel. So we, you know, we put our plans together. They put their plans together, and we sort of dedupe it because you, uh, you know, there's two berths in Amber Cove, so you know, three or four of us can't be there at the same time. So yeah. uh, there's a fair amount of work that goes into that. Is there any si si uh, sibling rivalry going on ever on some of those port calls? <laughs> <laughs> Can I plead the fifth on that? Um, no, so I'd, I'd say it's a uh, friendly competition. Yeah. How about that? You know, everybody is driven to succeed. Um, and, you know, we share very nicely, um, you know, because uh, Holland America and Princess are more seasonal in the Caribbean, we, we end up being the biggest users of Half yeah. Moon Key and Princess Keys because we're there year round. So we can, we and we have just more ships on the East Coast of the US that can be there on a regular basis. So yeah. we're the biggest customer there. And quite frankly, we're the biggest, you know, because of our Caribbean focused deployment, we're the biggest customer for most of the um, corporate Caribbean ports and many non-corporate ports as yeah. well. Well, very interesting. All right. Well, before we did this, we had uh, some secret information you were going to share, but then we had to make sure with PR that it was okay for you to share. And they told you you couldn't, but we still have a lot of good stuff to talk about. Um, just can't share any secretive stuff that will be coming out in the next few weeks. <laughs> I was a little disappointed. I told you it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work well with the boss though. So. No, you probably would have gotten your hand slapped for that. <laughs> Exactly. But no, like you said, we've got a lot of really exciting stuff to talk about. And to me, the most exciting thing is Celebration Key, yeah. um, which just really unlocks a lot of new itinerary uh, possibilities for us. Also, from what I talked about earlier, the fuel and carbon 
uh, emissions. It's very important there because it's it's close to the U.S., closer than uh, you know Half Moon Key even uh, for us, and that uh, that helps in that regard. And not only that, but it's just going to be a, a rock and destination that I know is going to drive a lot of happy memories for our guests. Yeah. And we're excited uh, that uh, we have a date. Those itineraries do start in July. Uh, we opened, uh, I believe it was over 400 of them for sale uh, oh, about two weeks ago. Uh, and that's for the period July through April, which is the, you know, the section that we have uh, open for sale right now. And uh, I've got another slide, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there. Um, the right. other highlight. What, I, I should know the answer to this, but which is the first ship stopping at Celebration Key? So I, I'm going to have to defer that question um, okay. for another week or so because um, the, oh, the might, actual ship, be the ones that are there. <laughs> the, the first ship to visit might just be one that's not currently yet open for sale. Oh, okay. So right. uh, that, that's why I want to defer on that one. Okay, no worries. No worries. Um, and then, so the other highlight uh, is Carnival Panorama. So uh, some of you may have seen, we've been uh, testing some eight and six day itineraries, you know, that she's been doing the, what I'll call the classic seven day Mexican Riviera, Riviera itinerary, you know, the same one that the Love Boat did a hundred years ago, um, <laughs> Cabo, Puerto Vallarta, Mazatlan. Um, she's been doing that for, you know, since inception and our ships that have been in that market before have done the same. And, we uh, we we tried out some eight and six day itineraries, um, and the eight day is the the classic plus La Paz, um, and uh, it seems to be working very very well. Um, you know the the guests appreciate having something different, um, and also you know the shorter six day fits into those who either have less time or less money uh, to spend on a, a near week vacation. Uh, so uh, we, we've done a few in the 24, 25 uh, cycle, and we're going all in for 25, 26. So she's going to be 100% on the eight and six day. That's great. Uh, so that's exciting news. I think uh, it, uh, it, it'll, uh, it'll be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, the other big, big uh, change for this year is Carnival Legend is going to be to San Francisco now. So uh, Miracle has done the past uh, couple of seasons for us out of San Francisco. So now we're going to switch uh, switch it up uh, with Legend, offering a similar program uh, of 10-day cruises to Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're going to do a little differently in, uh, in uh, 24, summer 24, we did all long cruises to Alaska, 10 and 11 day. And uh, now what we're going to do in 25 is we're going to intersperse them with four day, uh, what we call long weekend cruises to Ensenada. Uh, so it's a Thursday to Monday. And those actually, uh, we, we did some of those in 23 and they were quite successful. Uh, so we're going to mix it up and give the folks in uh, San Francisco uh, a choice of a long weekend cruise or an Alaska cruise. That's great. Uh, yeah. And then um, Legend, when she finishes up in San Francisco, she's going to go to Galveston. Uh, hopefully everyone knows that uh, we did start a, a long cruise winter program in Galveston uh, for the 24-25 winter with um, Miracle, uh, doing a range of sailings between 9 and 12 days to give the folks in the, the Gulf region you know, some longer, uh, more diverse itineraries to choose from. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we've, uh, we've, we've uh, swapping out legend and we're doing it a little differently. It's going to be a consistent rotation of 10 and four. So she'll be doing a 10 day cruise followed by a four. The fours um, are on opposite weeks from Carnival Breeze, which also does a four on a Thursday. So basically we'll have a long weekend cruise every week. And then the last uh, highlight for the 25, 26 is that this is the, this will be the beginning of our year round uh, Norfolk program. Mm -hmm. So Carnival Sunshine is her last sailing in Charleston. Um, sad, to, sad to see her go. Yeah. Um, is uh, the New Year's sailing in uh, 2024. Uh, and then she heads off to Dry Dock for uh, a period. And then when she's back from Dry Dock in February of 2025, she'll be full-time uh, in Norfolk from there. So that's uh, pretty much the, uh, the highlights. And yeah. uh, we can... Uh, well, and Fred, we just recently uh, started Spirit out of Mobile, which also gives them more options as well, too, right? Right. So uh, Spirit is is uh, in Mobile now. 
And, you know, if you'll remember from the pre-COVID days, uh, we had fantasy there for a very long time and we were doing mostly short cruises, four and five day. Yep. Uh, now with spirit, we're, uh, we're actually doing eight and six days. Uh, and so it gives, uh, you know, a better variety of itineraries, particularly if you think about, you know, not only the local area, but I always like, you know, look at like this, you know, the funnel that goes up from Mobile into yeah. uh, Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Alabama. There's a, there's a big market in all those regions yeah. and they can go to New Orleans or they can go to Mobile and the drive is kind of similar either way. So we wanted to, uh, to offer, you know, we already have a four and a five day from New Orleans. So we thought, uh, let's try eight and six from Mobile. And we don't have an eight and six in, in uh, New Orleans. So it gives a nice itinerary diversity in that region. Yeah. Hey, Fred, uh, I don't know if everybody in the audience knows this or not, but usually when you do uh, programs, there are eight and six, four, five, five. They always equal 14. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, because it's just a pattern that works, um, particularly in places. Uh, Galveston is a good example where the available berths are tight. So um, an eight and a six and a five and a five and a five four. Uh -huh. um, they basically use opposite Saturdays uh, yeah. during the course of a week. So the you know the five five four is Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. It's uh, uh, yeah, Thursday to Monday, Monday to Thursday. No, Thursday to Monday, Monday to Saturday. Okay. Yes. So basically, the way it works is every other Saturday, the five and four is in. And same thing, every other Saturday, the eight is in. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they, they dovetail nicely together. And that's why you'll see, uh, see that pattern. Yeah. Uh, and it, well, it works well. Say it has to be because it's two weeks, right? So you have to have... Right. It's by seven, seven, seven. So, <laughs> anyway. yeah, you always try to make it an increment of seven. Um, 21 gets like a repeating pattern on 21 gets yeah. harder because then you, that, that nice meshing of the five, four and the eight, six goes out of whack when yeah. you uh, have something that repeats on three weeks. Yeah. Well, it's, it's crazy all the things you have to keep in mind. All right. So, like I said, we were going to sure. reveal stuff today, but we're not going to. So, stay tuned for more announcements, right, Fred? Stay tuned for more announcements. So uh, yeah, so here's, uh, here's our lineup from uh, South and Central Florida, Miami and Port Canaveral. Um, and you'll see there's a couple to be announced blocks there. Um, prizes for anyone that guesses, but uh, <laughs> so uh, in Miami, uh, you know, currently we've got uh, five ships year round. We've got a seven, which is celebration. Uh, we've got two ships doing the eight and six rotation, Horizon and Magic. We've got a three and a four with Conquest and a five and five, five, four uh, with Sunrise. So, so far we've got uh, Celebration and Conquest uh, open for sale. I think you'll see us do something similar-ish uh, for uh, the remaining uh, fleet there. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, to me, uh, the, the biggest thing about uh, our change, so to speak, for 2526 is that every ship that is sailing from Miami and Port Canaveral will visit uh, celebration key. That's great. not necessarily every week. Um, uh, Mardi Gras celebration will visit every week, but uh, the others will uh, will go on a on a pretty regular basis. So there'll be lots and lots of opportunity for someone that wants to to see our spectacular new destination. Whether they want to go for three days or eight days uh, or even longer, we'll have some journeys cruises that touch there too. I think there's a couple bullets there if you want to. I think you've got the clicker, Adolfo. Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, Yep. I'm so clicked. celebration I don't want to key. Do too many clicks because it'll go to the next slide. I don't want to screw. You don't it up. want to steal my surprise, right? Yeah. Um, so that that's it. There's no more clicks. Uh, okay. So one of the um, one of the things that uh, celebration key does allow for us is we'll now have a new uh, four port itinerary with oh, uh, with Mardi Gras and celebration. So uh, you know we used to do a four port long ago with the seven day ships out of Miami and Canaveral. Uh, as fuel and carbon became more to the forefront, uh, we we dialed back on those. Uh, but now, because of the geography, uh, we're able to uh, to piece that together. So, uh, what they'll be doing on their four port is uh, Amber Cove, Grand Turk, uh, Nassau, and Celebration Key, uh, and that's the same for both Mardi Gras and Celebration. 
Uh, there will also be a, a mix of a Western itinerary. So it's similar to the West that we've been doing. Uh, however, uh, now we'll be visiting Celebration Key with those as well. So Cozumel, Roatan, and Celebration Key. And then uh, in uh, the case of Celebration out of Miami, we'll also have a, a three-port, uh, seven-day cruise that's going to reach down to St. Thomas. So uh, you know, basically for going a little further geographically down to St. Thomas, you, you lose a port, but you, know, you gain something that uh, maybe uh, folks hadn't been to before and opportunity to visit a new destination. And that includes Celebration Key as well. Right. And, and, you know, I, I can't wait till we get to reveal more about Celebration Key because it's going to be pretty spectacular. I mean, what we've already shared seems spectacular, but once the details start coming out, I think people will be really impressed and excited about uh, this new destination for us. Yeah, and we've got uh, over 100 other itineraries coming soon, uh, 100 other cruises, sailings uh, featuring Celebration Key. So stay tuned for those. Cool. All right. Here's another one full of codes. <laughs> Another one full of codes. Yeah, so that's a, a good point. So these are our ship codes. Do um, I have anything to click here? Any bullets? Uh, uh, let me see. I think you may, but yes. I don't know. Yes. Yep. So no, no more clicks. There's no more okay. bullets here. So yeah. So we already talked about it, but Sunshine is doing a full year of uh, Norfolk sailings. She is doing an eight and a six day there. So uh, the eight day generally goes to uh, Half Moon. Uh, Key, Grand Turk, and Amber Cove, um, but we will be mixing in some uh, Celebration Key there once she comes online. Uh, the sixth day in the summers, we'll, uh, some of them will visit Bermuda, um, and others will go uh, to uh, Grand Bahama. And then uh, Carnival Pride from Baltimore, she's doing uh, Celebration Key every week. When she's in the Caribbean, she does some Bermuda uh, every now and again, and uh, Elation, is doing a five and four day uh, from Jacksonville. And there's a pretty uh, pretty good selection of celebration key itineraries in there too. Great. I, I'm just amazed that I'm looking at 2026 on here that we're already open through 2026 on a lot of ships through through the you know the winter. It's pretty right? pretty amazing that you guys are opening that far in advance. Yeah. So I'm I'm never one of those people that writes last year date on my check because. My, my brain is, I'm usually writing 2025 or 2024 on my check. <laughs> my brain is way, way out in front. Um, so yeah, so kudos, kudos to the team that, uh, that, that thinks well in advance and gets this all out. So um, our lineup in the Gulf Coast. So we'll start with Galveston. Uh, all this stuff is already open for sale. We've got uh, Jubilee doing her seven days. Uh, she launches in, uh, I think it's December, I want to say the 23rd of this year. Uh, Dream is going to keep on with her eight and six day itinerary, and the the eight day uh, will be uh, an Eastern Caribbean, uh, and it will hit Celebration Key on every eight, so that's uh, roughly every other week for her. Um, Breeze keeps going with the five and fours, and then uh, we talked a little bit before. Um, Legend will be doing the long cruises out of Galveston, which is a ten day. Uh, that's going to be a bit of a mix of uh, Western Caribbean and also Easterns, and those Easterns will hit Celebration Key. And uh, the four-day long weekend cruises, the Thursday to Mondays, on opposite weeks from Breeze. Right. New Orleans, we've got Liberty already open for sale, doing a seven-day from New Orleans. And she does, give or take once a month, I think, uh, a seven-day uh, Eastern itinerary that will stop in the Bahamas, including Celebration Key. Uh, we're yet to open for sale our, our four and five day program there. And then in Mobile, we've got uh, Spirit back again for another uh, winter season of uh, six and eight day cruises uh, out of Mobile. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Well, cool. Oh, you had some of these things here. Yeah. Oh, so and yet, so I think we, I, I think I got all that right. Yeah. Uh, Dream, uh, Liberty, and Spirit. Uh, I don't think I mentioned Spirit, but Spirit is going to be hitting up Celebration Key as well. Yeah. Oh, great. How exciting. Yeah, yes. So West Coast, I, I, I kind of talked about this at the beginning bullet, but you can see the little uh, arrow there where she moves from the Long Beach 7 to the Long Beach 8 program. PO is Panorama. Uh, we got Radiance doing the three and four day uh, cruises out of Long Beach and Firenze. Uh, we'll be carrying on with the uh, the five and four days that start in May of 
2024. So not long away before uh, Carnival Fun Italian style uh, joins the West Coast. Yes, exciting. In uh, Alaska, we've got our three ships back. Uh, so Luminosa and Spirit sailing from Seattle, um, seven day voyages. And then in uh, summer of 25, we will have Legend for the first time in San Francisco instead of Miracle. And she'll be doing the 10 day uh, Alaska and the four day long weekends to Ensenada. And I think I just talked through all those bullets there. Oh, I keep forgetting about your bullets. Yeah, Two, and we, we do have some, uh, some journeys cruises thrown in. So from both San Francisco and Seattle, we have a journeys Hawaii uh, cruise. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've been doing uh, Journeys Hawaii cruises from Long Beach as well. We've not opened for sale yet for 25.6, but uh, stay tuned for more there. Um, but uh, it's a nice uh, you know, round trip Hawaii opportunity. You don't have to you know, fly to and from Honolulu to make it work. That open uh, draw, that always is a killer. <laughs> yeah, pe people, uh, people seem to enjoy it. Yeah, great. And we're given, you know, the folks in San Francisco and Seattle the opportunity to, to get in on that action too. And uh, so the last uh, home port we're talking about here is Australia. So yeah. we've got our girl Splendor, who's been in Sydney uh, year round since. Oh boy, I think she got there. At 2019, the end of but she didn't get to do it for long. <laughs> yeah, she she kind of got there. Let's call it inappropriate, unfortunate timing um, yeah. at the very end of 19. But uh, we've got a smorgasbord of itineraries uh, out of both Sydney and Brisbane. Um, you know, everything from short breaks to either nowhere or Morton Island or Tasmania. Uh, Melbourne Cup is a bit of a unique one-off itinerary for folks that are uh, interested in Australia. That's uh, it's a big uh, horse racing uh, event mm -hmm. in Melbourne. So the ship basically goes to Melbourne. You get your tickets to the uh, racing event, and it's uh, it's uh, very well. Uh, very popular and uh, very fun event. And then, uh, you know, of more interest to the folks that are uh, from North America uh, going over to take part in our Australia cruises. We've got the uh, nine or 10 day Great Barrier Reef, 10 and 11 day New Zealand. And usually once or twice a uh, year, we'll do a, a cruise as far as Papua New Guinea. And um, I should mention, and I'm sure your trade partners all know this now, but uh, we, uh, you know, when we originally were in Australia, we were operating on the reservation system yeah. of our sisters down there. And it was, let's just say, less than easy to access from uh, here in North America. I made like a 27 uh, but, page document on how to book a cruise if you're right, a North American so agent. <laughs> it, it is now push a button simple. If you uh, have guests that, uh, customers that want to uh, head on down to Australia, you can uh, see them right on our uh, reservation system. and easy breezy and go CCL to book. Yeah. Uh, sa same with Carnival Luminosa. So she's uh, seasonally in Brisbane. Um, she's got some short cruises and mixed in with six, seven or eight day cruises to either the Great Barrier Reef or the uh, Pacific Islands. Uh, we've got Papua New Guinea there too. And then it's so really of interest, I think, to folks here in North America is we've got some very uh, uh, interesting journeys cruises that are trans-Pacific uh, to and from Seattle, uh, calling in uh, both Alaska and uh, Japan. So those are pretty exciting. Yeah, no, that's really great. And I always, you know, I always tell uh, travel advisors that, you know, you you probably don't necessarily automatically think of Carnival in Australia, and especially since we were there for like 10 years before we moved there over to our system. Um, yep. uh, but we definitely have... Uh, you know, these avid carnival cruisers that love to try everything. And, uh, you know, if, if you're thinking about Australia, think about carnival, because I can guarantee you have carnival guests that would love, uh, you know, this longer, more exotic vacation. Uh, uh, and, you know, not only is the cruise more expensive, so you can make more money on commission, um, but uh, you can also, you know, add in, you know, pre-cruise, post-cruise, uh, uh, destinations and all in in Australia or New Zealand or whatever, and uh, it really is a great opportunity. And it is definitely picked up. Uh, the U.S. guests are definitely going a lot more uh, now, uh, as I've probably done ten thousand <laughs> webinars on Australia. Um, but yeah, no, think car think Australia, think Carnival. And here's sure. the great image of 
celebration key. Yes, yeah, so some pretty uh, spectacular looking pool areas there from uh, from what I can see. And I too am excited to see uh, the additional details as they uh, get released over the next uh, month. So it should be yeah. uh, super exciting for your customers. Uh, hopefully uh, should be a lot of demand to go there. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, July of 25 when our first call goes. So right now, and I think you can flip to the next slide, Adolfo, we've got uh, 12 ships open for sale from eight different home ports. Uh, so you've got Miami, Canaveral, Jacksonville, Norfolk, Baltimore, Galveston, New Orleans, and Mo uh, Mobile. And uh, the first call is going to be in, uh, like I said, July of 25 for a ship as yet to be announced to be the very first one there. Uh, Mardi Gras and Celebration are going to be going every week. So be it their Eastern or Western Caribbean itineraries, uh, they will uh, call in Celebration Key. We're going to have uh, two more home ports uh, that will be announced uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months and six more ships. So altogether, we'll have 18. That, wow. Uh, we'll, we'll visit uh, Celebration Key. Yeah, so it's... How many people uh, do you think we'll have uh, going to, uh, when it's a full year, how many guests will have the opportunity to check out Celebration Key, more or less? So uh, there's actually a bullet coming up on that. Good question. Um, so yeah, it, uh, it'll be over 2 million when uh, she's operational uh, for a full year. That's great. So. That's fantastic. I cannot wait. So we announce more and I can't wait till July of 2025. Yeah. And we also, uh, you know, there's the project going underway at uh, Half Moon Key to build a pier there. So that will enable us to go there more frequently as well. And uh, you know, so now we'll have two super Absolutely. highly rated destinations there that uh, we can uh, dock at, uh, which is just a, you know, it's a, a better experience for the guests. And, you know, frankly, we, we miss a call every now and again at Half Moon Key because of the tendering and uh, the swell. And so that should uh, cut down a lot on yep. uh, that situation. So, yep. Looking forward to that one. So Tomorrow. journeys. So uh, for, we have expanded on this program pretty significantly since it started. So a little bit of the history here. Um, well, first of all, to go to the, the, the base level. So journeys are longer voyages. We've got special, unique programming on board uh, that you can only get on a journey's voyage. And uh, we launched that program back in 2015. That was my job in marketing. Was when it? I worked, when I came back from the UK, I worked in marketing, and that was one of my product launches that I had to do. Ah, so you can tell everyone what it is, what special program is, is on board. <laughs> well, I know there's the <laughs> throwback C day where there's a midnight buffet. There's the, you know, yep. all the stuff that people kind of expected back in the day. Um, but it's it's just a great, not you know, not to mention you get to go to a bunch of different, you know, cool places. Um, but you get to have some of that throwback stuff on board, which people really, really, I remember kind of thinking, eh, who cares about a midnight buffet anymore? <laughs> Apparently a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we've been growing this from the, the start with six sailings and now we've, uh, uh, you know, we're up to 22 in 2019 and then we're going to have over 40 in 2024. So we've, we've really expanded on the, uh, the variety and offering of these. And there's currently, if you look from now out through the sailings that we have open through April of 2026, 90 voyages open for sale. So something for everyone and yep. about 70 different itineraries. Uh, and we've been adding new destinations. Um, you know, I, when I first started working for Carnival 30 years ago, and I'm sure you feel the same way, Adolfo, if someone said, well, when is a Carnival ship going to visit, visit Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, for example? <laughs> You're like... Uh, we'll never live to see ever, day, but you know, it, darn if it isn't happening now and uh, well, happened already and will be happening uh, again on a future journeys cruise. But we, uh, we keep adding new destinations. We've got a few more, uh, let's say surprises uh, coming out in the next uh, couple months. So stay tuned. Uh, we visited every continent uh, except for Africa and Antarctica. Uh, someday we'll get that, get there. Um, yeah. But more than 100 different ports in 40 different countries around the world. So, uh, you know, we're, we're no longer just the Caribbean and uh, South Pacific and Mexriv uh, brand. Nope. But a few examples of where we're going, uh, New Zealand on a, a fairly regular 
uh, bases throughout the Australia summer. So our winter, uh, we've got those Trans-Pacific cruises that we talked about a little while ago. We've got mm -hmm. uh, a couple cruises from Singapore to and from Singapore uh, hitting Southeast Asia. And these are the ones that are going to Vietnam. Uh, we've had some uh, Greenland cruises uh, from Baltimore. Very popular. Uh, Yep, yeah, very popular this year. We we're going again in 24. Um, so stay tuned for more. Uh, we've got transatlantic cruises, uh, you know, to and from. Sometimes it's driven by the, you know, the need for the ship to be in dry dock. Uh, other times it's uh, just to be as part of our European season. And then we do a lot of journeys um, in the Caribbean uh, for folks that are looking to get a little uh, deeper exploration in uh, the Caribbean also, you know, have a few more sea days, this throwback uh, fun and enjoy the journey's programming. And we've got 12 different North American home ports that uh, feature journeys. And, you know, they go to, you know, places that you wouldn't get on your typical seven or eight day cruise like Colombia, the Panama Canal, uh, Costa Rica, Grenada, um, you know, you name it in the Southern Caribbean. So, uh, yeah, so we're, uh, we're excited about that. It continues to be well received. Uh, but don't forget, we still have uh, a lot of short cruises for folks, too. So, yeah. you know, we, we try to cover the gamut. Yeah. Well, that's great. Fred, listen, thanks so much. I know that everybody uh, gets so much out of your uh, out of your talks because uh, it really is a fascinating topic. And uh, we'd like to open it up to some Q&A. So, Jerry, if you want to read us some of the questions from the Q&A um, and hopefully Fred can answer them. Sure. So one of the first questions we're getting from the audience is on determining um, how long, I guess, determining how long it takes to get to a port, right? So one of the agents says, um, how do you determine from which port do ships go to which destination? So how does that all come about? So um, um, I think there's two ways I could interpret that question. So I'll try to answer both. One is sort of the, what I'll call the classic uh, La Havre, Paris question, right? So Paris doesn't have a port that we can get to, but we can go to La Havre. So uh, obviously there's you know, quite a few of those, um, Civitavecchia, Rome, or Barnamunde, Berlin. So you know, we try to, uh, in our, uh, how we market and sell the cruises, um, include both names for the ports. And in fact, we actually just undertook an exercise because in some cases, we would have, we, you know, we have one port in parentheses and one port not, and we were a little inconsistent about uh, how they were. So we've uh, now consistently applied it as, you know, it's Varnamunde and then in parentheses Berlin. So always the place that we're going to dock is listed first. So uh, that, that might have been the intent of the question. If, if it's not, then I'll answer what the other way I could interpret is, which is, you know, how, like, how far and how do you determine you know, can we get from, for example, Amber Cove to San Juan or Amber Cove to Grand Turk? Uh, and how do you figure out how long it takes and uh, can it be done? So uh, number one, we've done many of these legs over the years. So we know the distances. We also have uh, tools that we use that, that show the distances, the speeds required, uh, the uh, fuel consumption. Uh, so our, our itinerary planners put that into their modeling uh, to, uh, to find the most fuel efficient sequence. Now, unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. So the most fuel efficient sequence doesn't always work because there might be other ships in port on some days. So it's a bit of a juggling act. Um, and you'll see, you know, oh, well, and there's, there's classic ports that we can reverse very easily. So you can go to Amber Cove or Grand Turk, you can switch them out very uh, generally, very simply. Um, some of the Bahamas ports can switch around. So ho hopefully that's answered the question. So Fred, that kind of was a good segue though into the, the next questions that we've been getting. So some of the advisors have been saying that they've been hearing from their clients about wanting to have shorter cruises out of Galveston or maybe even going to different destinations like Jamaica or the Caymans. So um, how does that implicate, right? Like because of Galveston, you are only able to get to locations based upon you said other ships being there or you know the different fuel stuff. So how do we determine whether ships can be 
three or four day sailings or seven, you know, to like eight day sailings. Yep. So it's uh, again, distance plays a big role here. So with Galveston, um, unfortunately, there's nowhere that we can get to on a three day cruise. So um, we can't take cruises to nowhere anymore. So <laughs> and right, exactly. CBP does not allow cruises to nowhere. So really, there is no such thing as a three day option from Galveston. But you do see, you know, we've got quite a few four days that we do as either part of the five and four program or the new legend uh, 10 and four program. Uh, so that's how we do that. And um, remind me of the second part of the question again, Jerry. Um, the seven to eight days, right? So it was like some agents are hearing that they want to have three to four. Oh, days. right. So came, came in and Jamaica. And came in and right? Jamaica, so yeah. so uh, we, we do offer those ports from uh, Galveston um, and also New Orleans. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Jubilee specifically, um, that just to tender that many people into Grand Cayman is, uh, let's just say, not uh, what we would consider the guest experience that we would want to offer. And so, unfortunately, we're not able to offer Cayman um, as a destination for Carnival Jubilee. And really, if, if you look at the geography, without Cayman, Jamaica doesn't really work anymore because the only way to do Jamaica would be a like a two port cruise that went to Jamaica and Cozumel. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't think people are quite ready to buy a seven day two port cruise. No. Um, but we do have uh, 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 Cayman and uh, Jamaica on uh, other sailings from Galveston and also again from New Orleans and Tampa for that matter. Another popular question that we've gotten from advisors today has been, how do we determine how long we're able to stay at a port? So um, it, again, I hate, I hate to sound like a broken record, but uh, time and speed come into play. So it, it's really all dependent upon where we're going next. And uh, sometimes you know, you'll see some cruises, since we're talking about the Gulf here, you'll see some cruises where we have to leave Cozumel at four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that's because we're uh, likely heading back to Galveston at the end of that leg. And it's just, it's a high speed to get there. Um, so, you know, we're kind of constrained on the departure. You can get there earlier, but you know, then you, you get into uh, discussions of daylight, right? So you, there's no point in arriving at 6 a.m. because it'll be dark and no one will be up. So uh, that, that kind of uh, enters into it on that side. And then the same can be true in the other direction, there's some ports where we can't get there as early in the morning as we'd like just because of the speed. Um, and then again, you know, you can you can maybe stay later uh, based on the speed to the next destination. But if it once it goes dark in most of the, uh, you know, the beach type destinations, there's not as much left to do. Uh, so uh, we end up leaving you know, around uh, sunset time. Hey Fred, how fast on average do, do our ships go, or is it just change so much depending on the itinerary that there's not really an average? It varies. Um, you know, sometimes it can be quite slow. Other times they can be, you know, for a, a fast leg, call it 20 knots would be about the fastest. And uh, 20 knots is give or take uh, 23, 24 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. And the last uh, more kind of this comment, I think it's awesome. Maybe you can speak to this. A lot of the advisors are really excited about Celebration Key and are dying to know more. Where can they go to get more information? Well, everything that we know so far, they've already know. So there's there's not a lot that they know. <laughs> but we will be uh, releasing information. Uh, and of course, we'll email uh, that information. We'll have it on GoCCL. Um, so as we start releasing more details about Celebration Key, uh, they'll, you know, they'll be the first to know. Uh, but um, basically, that picture is all you know right now. We've got two freshwater lagoons. We have a family area, an adults area. We have retail. We have food. Uh, but other than that, those details, um, we haven't released much yet, but it will come out. We like to drip feed that info because it makes it more exciting. <laughs> And it gives us something to talk about for a longer period of time. So uh, just stay tuned. It, it, we, I promise you, you will not be disappointed, though. That I can assure you. Sure. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Fred, I'm just going to give away some prizes. I got the email, my text with the winner's names. And then uh, 
you'll be free to go. So okay. uh, we're going to be giving away these uh, packing cubes. Uh, there are five lucky winners. If I call your name and only if I call your name, uh, send an email to trade support at carnival.com to claim your prize and we'll get that out to you. So the five winners are number one, Donna Thomas. Number two, John Nash. Number three, Timothy Hartwell. Four, Victoria Banks. Why does that name sound familiar? Five, Amanda Santana. Um, so again, Donna Thomas, John Nash, Timothy Hartwell, Victoria Banks, and Amanda Santana. Congratulations to you guys. Make sure you send an email to trade support at carnival.com only if I called your name. <laughs> Um, and we will get that out to you. So Fred, thanks again for uh, all the uh, great info that you shared today. Uh, I'm sure that the agents really appreciated it. It's always cool to understand the inner workings of uh, a big company like Carnival Cruise Line, and uh, you are a big part of that inner working, and uh, everything you shared, I'm sure, was very, very well um, very well uh, uh, taken by our our our, our uh, audience today because it really is. I find it super interesting. I hope they do it as much as I did. But it looked like we had quite a few people on, and they were on the whole time. So awesome! Well, thanks. This is a lot of fun, and uh, thanks uh, for spending an hour with us, everybody. Yeah, and, and we'll have uh, you back too. We'll look forward to doing it again. Yep. All right. Take care. All Bye, right. everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining.